son is starting to become somewhat of an issue from a behavioral standpoint due to his mom essentially no longer playing any sort of active role in his life. Where is mom? Mom is currently in a mental health facility outside of Philadelphia. Yikes, man. What's up? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney Show. So glad that you're hanging out with us. Hope your life's doing well. I was going to say, I hope the gas prices have come down, but they won't have. And so hope we are getting through that together and figuring out bread and diapers and formula. It's just a mess. It's a mess out there. And um, when things get messy, remember, lean into the messy, lean into the generosity, not... I got to get mine. And I know that's so hard to do. So hard to do. Just practice it. Try it. Practice it and try it. So, hey, we got a packed show today. And um, I got some heads up on what's coming. And so there's a lot on the show. So I'm going to go straight to the phones and not do a couple of minutes of cringy pre-call talk here. So let's go to Lawrence in Philadelphia. What's up, Brother Lawrence? Uh, Hey, Doc. How you doing? I'm good, my man. How are you? Well, I have kind of a rough season going on right now. Yeah, appreciate man. you uh, taking your time to speak with me. Oh, you got it. Anytime. So what's up, my brother? So I'm, I'm a single dad, and I've had uh, both kids essentially full-time since October of 2018. My, uh, my daughter turns nine on Saturday, and, and my son is 11. Um, my son is starting to become somewhat of an issue from a behavioral standpoint. He is struggling with life right now. He's full of tons of anxiety and and frustration due to his mom essentially no longer playing any sort of active role in his life, which I completely understand. Where is mom? Uh, uh, Mom is currently in a mental health facility outside of Philadelphia. Yikes, man. How long was uh, it degenerative? How long was that going on? Well, you know, she, she, when I met her, uh, I knew that she was regularly taking opioids because she was in a car accident in college when a tree fell on her car and she suffered from chronic migraines. Okay. Back in the early 2000s, what the best neurologists would do is they would just toss a whole bunch of narcotics at you. That's right. Just, just to manage the pain. And when, you know, the effect of the narcotics took off um, at that point in time, they would switch the dosage or the brand or whatever case it was. And unfortunately, she became hooked. Yep. Um, I don't blame her for that. Uh, it's unfortunate. And, you know, I... I was somewhat ignorant to what narcotics could do to someone because back when you and I were growing up, John, they didn't really refer to any type of opioid pandemic. And I just didn't know what the symptoms of addiction were with respect to something that brilliant doctors prescribed and was readily available at pharmacies. That's right. Yeah. Um, I'm so sorry. So, That's that, that I've, I've seen that up close. That'll take your, take everything. I'm so sorry, man. Yeah. It's, 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 it's unfortunate. And it, it ultimately changed everything uh, in our lives. It, it tore our family apart. There was, uh, there were certain things that went on, which just forced me to unfortunately file for a divorce, mm-hmm. which I never saw myself doing, but here we are. Yeah. Um, other things started happening at which point, um, got my lawyer involved and we filed for uh, residential custody and they've been living with me ever since. And okay. since August of 2021, they've seen her in person like an hour and a half. And was they she a, in, was she institutionalized when they saw her? No, she wasn't. Okay. Um, she wasn't, she was living with, uh, their sister's father at the time. They have a sister that's going to be three. They've seen her maybe a handful of times uh, since she's been born because of issues with her mother. Yeah. Um, it's it's just it's really frustrating. And it's yeah. you know it's, it's it's a lot of things. It's, it, it's a lot on me, but you know I'm doing my best just to give the kids as regular of a life as possible under the circumstances. So um, first thing, do this for me, okay? Take as deep breath as you possibly can and hold it for a second. Hold it. Hmm. No, you let it out, it's a cheater. I did. Take it in. Let me try again. Take it in and hold it. Restart. You can edit this out. Nope, we're leaving it in. Hold it. All right, let it out. And then I want you to drop your shoulders down as hard as you can. Pull them down, okay? Sure. I can feel you talking about this and starting to speed up your cadence because this is still really. This is your. This is not as though this is a healing wound. This is a. This thing's still bleeding, right? The cut's still happening, right? It's, so. it's daily. Yeah. All right. Um, did was she taken when she was pregnant? She she was. We had her monitor, monitored by um, a a different doctor that essentially 
weaned her down to a smaller dose, but she was still taking um, during both pregnancies. Um, did your kid, either one of your kids or your son especially, um, was he diagnosed with NALS, uh, neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome? He wasn't diagnosed with it shortly after he was born. He was put in the, the NICU just for monitoring. Okay. Um, they were worried about that. They didn't do any of that with my daughter. Okay. All right. So the, she, so your wife wasn't on methadone or any of the other? She was not on methadone, no. Okay. So they just were just cutting her dose. Okay. Um, all right. So I want to be real careful about something. And hopefully this gives you some peace, even though it's going to feel like it's going to make things more chaotic. Okay. I want you to do your best you can from this point forward for the rest of your kid's life of not saying because of or due to, okay? Um, earlier on when you're talking about your son's anxiety, he's got this anxiety because he, it's, because he can't see mom. He probably has that anxiety for a whole cocktail of reasons, okay? And whenever we dump, we distill it down to a single single problematic data point, we try to solve that data point and it never makes the whole thing better. And so I want to look at the whole ecosystem that's going on here, okay? Um, there are a, and you probably know these, but this is just for the audience as much as it is for you. Um, the longitudinal neurodevelopment literature is all over the place. And so one of the first things I do is I take animal models and I move them out. And when you do that, there's just not a ton of stuff out there. Um, some of them show um, opioid use in utero um, effects of things like IQ and language development, all that kind of stuff. Some of them show no development, no difference. Some of them show difference for up until like four or five months. Some of them show difference in boys and in girls. Almost all of them universally, um, this is with methadone, so I think it's with methadone, maybe it's the other way, um, show some sort of increased risk for anxiety, for ADHD and all that. So that's cool to know that. Um, here's where I think a lot of those studies miss, and it's I don't blame the studies because they're just trying to, to, to set a baseline biochemically. But your kids have grown up in a world of chaos, is that right? Unfortunately, yep. Hey, don't do that to yourself, okay? It just is. It's, it, it's, okay, let me give you that. It is unfortunate, but I don't want you to take ownership of the misfortune at this point, okay? Um, they grew up with a mom as an addict. And for a kid, you know this, but that's so um, dysregulating to see a human in front of you and touch them, but they're not really there. You know what I mean? Luckily, at the time, they're so young that I don't think they realize that. Well, I'm telling you, their bodies for sure did. 1,000% did. They absorbed it. The same disconnect you felt relationally, where you could be holding hands with somebody that you knew was not there, you could sleep with somebody, have sex with somebody, and they're not there, they picked that same thing up, and it's it's exponentially worse, worse because they have neuronal development going on right then. Okay. And so what, what I am most compelled by is Gabor Mate and others who have looked at pre maternal stress in utero stress in moms creates this downstream of this, this cocktail that pulses through these kids and they end up with anxiety and all sorts of a cascade of things down the road. Why do I tell you that? The thing that you can control right now is the ecosystem, the peace. Right. And that's, that is where I want you to focus your energy on moving forward. Um, so I just gave you a lot of info and I didn't even let you ask your question. So what is your question? Question. Um, the behavioral issues are starting to be something beyond my control. Okay. Um, Tell me about them. Starting to become, you know, just talking back, you know, hitting kids, biting kids. Like what, what are we talking about here? He, yeah. I mean, he's, he's been, he's been suspended a uh, time or two due to physical um, issues. Um, there was a time he started, you know, throwing hands at, at, at a sitter. I've, I've called the police on him on occasion because I didn't want to hurt him while restraining him. And he was just somewhat out of control. Okay. Um, I, in terms of discipline, you know, I, 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 I do my, I have a hard time not yelling at times just because there's, there's seems to be nothing else to do at that time. I have him write sentences. Um, sentences was the latest thing that I've been doing uh, in terms of discipline, and, and he absolutely hates that. But lately, when I say write sentences, he will just say, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And, and you know, all this stuff combined, the issues at school, his therapist is saying,
saying we want to get him psychoanalyzed. His family crisis counselor at school wants to get him psychoanalyzed. You know, law enforcement has spoken to him and they say, you know, he definitely needs some type of psychiatric evaluation. And I'm just I'm worried. Yeah. He's going to be put on meds. Yeah. Because cause I know what he did to his mom. Yeah. Yeah. And your, your fear is, is um, valid. Okay. Let me talk. Let me talk to you about a couple of, of things until we get to the psychoanalytic part, okay? Um, or the psychoanalysis, not psychoanalytics. Um, so I want you to start thinking about that body, that little boy's body. How old is he? You said he's eleven. Eleven, okay. Fifth grade. Fifth grade. So you have a little boy whose body is being overwhelmed by the sensations and feelings. And that comes out with behaviors that in adults are criminal acts. And in children, it's simply symptomatic of a body that is, um, think of a cup underneath a faucet. It's just overflowing, okay? And throwing hands, punching, swinging, yelling, just that caustic screaming is a body that's dysregulated. And this is going to sound counterintuitive, but that's a body screaming for connection in, in in a backwards, chaotic way. And so it's a body screaming for boundaries in a chaotic way. And yet there's a dysregulation for when you put boundaries down. Now he's like, no, I'm not doing that. And so I want you to begin to think of punishment, not as a way to force him to do things he doesn't like or are uncomfortable with him. Can will you be willing to flip the whole paradigm around for me? Uh, I'm willing to try anything, Doc. Oh, okay. I want you just to try this for 30 days. And if it's a bust, write me back. And I promise I'll read the email l- aloud um, on the show that I've, I failed you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, here's what I want you to do. Uh, well, let me ask you one more question. Have you ever sat down with him and just talked about mom, how heartbreaking it is for everybody? Yes. Okay. They are very difficult conversations. Yeah. How do they, how do they go? I mean, <clears throat> as of late, it's trying to understand, it's trying to tell him why he can't see mom currently, okay. you know, to try to express why there's mom's mind is sick. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, every time he sees him, she looks normal and, you know, her voice sounds normal. Oh, Having a kid comprehend that their brain is sick and making them do things or not do things that they should be doing, that's, that's a very difficult concept. Yeah. And then the whole thing, like, there's no way for him even to talk to her. That's a hard thing, you know. Yeah. If we've done the thing, well, you know, it's almost like, you know, she's, she's dead. It's the same thing. Yes. And except she's not. Her. And that's the problem. There's she's no not. closure, right? No, no. Yeah. It's just, she's not there. Yeah. And, you know, he has a hard time thinking, you know, well, daddy, you know, you did this. Where are you keeping from mommy? So I have him call yeah. my ex's mom. You know, she'll confirm everything. You know, I keep telling him how much I love him. Yeah. Okay. So I want you to, this is not at this point about data. This is about his body. Okay. And so what we're going to do is we're going to address the body here. Here's a couple ways so we're going to do that. Number one, we're going to, if you don't already, invite him into this. Don't force him. The whole world's been forced upon him, okay? So I want you to invite him in to, and again, I got a 12-year-old, and I know this is awkward, okay? And even my son's like, Dad, and I just tell him, this one's for your old man, even though I know it's for him, is a 20 to 30-second hug a couple of times a day, maybe right before school and after school and say, we're going to do hug time. And he may go, dad, I'm not doing that. See if you can get him to buy into that. Okay. And your daughter too. Cool. Gotcha. The second thing is I want you to find ways, highly intentionally, intentional ways, not accidental ways to put your hand on his skin, preferably on his face or on the back of his neck. Okay. And when you're hugging him, I want you to put one hand on the back of his neck and hold that area 20 to 30 seconds, two or three times a day. Okay. There's a ton of bioregulatory sensory stuff that happens, skin to skin trans transmission, and it's going to bring his heart rate down. It's going to bring his body down. Okay. And all we're trying to do is teach him what it feels like to not be spun up. And we're going to teach him that in the presence of dad and in the presence of relationship is where you find that spinning slowdown. And right now, everything about relationships spins that sucker up. You see what I'm saying? I do. These are quiet teaching moments that I'm stunned or not in every psychiatric office in the world. Um, I would even go as far to say something as silly as, um, oh, man. 
um, some sort of, hey, let me massage your fingers. Let me massage, like, uh, we hold a lot of tension in our hands, a lot of tension in our feet. Um, with little children, little, little kids who have been abused, one of the things that a, th- a, a therapist might do is take lotion and just rub feet because all we're doing is teaching the body how to be touched and how to, whew, okay, so that's number one. Number two, have y'all done any sort of letter writing to mom? No, Not I, I tried to get him to write in a journal just to capture his thoughts and he just, he's even hesitant to doing that. Okay, um, two things to do there. Number one, um, get a journal that is between you two and tell him, hey, this is two secret guys just for two dudes. And you write to him and leave it on his bed. And all he, ha- he has to bring it back and put it on your bed. Hopefully it's got one line in it. Yeah. And in that journal, I want you to do age appropriate stuff, but let him know that you miss mom. Let him know that today was a hard day or today was a good day or today I actually cried. And what we're teaching him is dad's not crazy and he's not crazy. And so his feelings start to look like dad's because right now you look like a big, strong, tough, got it all together guy. And we want to teach him, no, here's what's going on in dad's heart. And he can read it over and over and over again. Okay. And hopefully he begins to share with you. I've heard parents write me back and say, my kid just wrote today was good. And if they start weeping with, they didn't, they've never had that level of connection. Okay. Um, another one is write letters to mom. And it'd be cool if y'all did this together and his letters may be short and you can tell him, you can be really angry. You can be really sad. I want you to tell her about what happened today, but we're going to write these things and we're going to put them in an envelope and you are not going to mail them. Okay. Mm -hmm. But this is an exercise and you can commit to doing it too. Sure. We're teaching him, here's where those feelings that are burning holes in us, here's where they go. Here's a good place to do that is to write it down, okay? Um, And then here's the last one, and then we'll get to the medication stuff. The last one is I want you to create with him and your daughter. I know this has been a mess. I know this is all hard. I miss mommy. Y'all miss mommy. But here's the world we're in right now. Mommy's in the hospital and she's not okay right now. And so we need to create some rules for our house. And you've probably heard me talk about this on the show multiple times. It works really well here. And what we're doing is we're going to go to like Michael's. We're going to go to a hardware store and get a big piece of board or whatever. We're going to doll it up and make it nice. And we're going to write the Lawrence, let's say your last name's Smith, the Smith family rules. This is who the Smiths are. And they're less rules, but they're more values. So let's call it that, the Smith values. And I want your kids, especially your son, but your daughter too, for them to have input on this. Who are we? And I want you all to make it a fun exercise, get ice cream and whatever their favorite food is. Make it a fun thing where y'all are writing things down and then you're going to paint it on this board and you're going to hang it up in the living room even if it doesn't match. Here's where we're getting at. When your son hits somebody... You, do not, you are not punishing him. He is choosing to go meet with the police. And what we're slowly going to do is teach him that he has a choice in how his day goes. Not that he's going to do something that will, that will cut off relationship. Because right now, he knows he can push you far enough that his punishment is disassociation with dad. That you sure. will use your relationship with him as a weapon. You did this, you have to go out of here. I'm casting you away from me. And when I want to flip that on its head and I want him to understand that when I do this, I'm choosing to leave dad and I don't like to do that. Because right now he's trying to see how far I can push you before you're going to go to. How far can I push my teacher before she disappears on me like mom did? And what we want to do is teach him Any disappearing is going to be a choice that you're making. And dude, it breaks. This is what I tell my kids. These are my exact words. It breaks my heart that that I'm choosing to have my heart broken right now that you chose to leave the room for 30 minutes or for an hour or to not go fishing with us. I'm choosing to be sad about that because I only like fishing when you're with me and you just chose to do X, Y, Z, not study for this test to not whatever. And you chose to not go, and I can't stand that. Please don't make that choice ever again because I don't like fishing without you. You see how we're flipping? And now I'm telling you, it's a light switch night and day in my home, okay? Because they feel this strong sense of ownership about it. Now, like all of us, sometimes it's like, 
yeah, it's worth it. I'm going to drive 70 over the speed limit. And if I get caught, I get caught, right? But most of the time I'm watching this thing shift. Okay. Now let's get to the meds. I do believe that your kid is in, in line for some sort of psycho eval. Okay. Sure. As a parent, I cannot speak to us as a psychiatrist. So I'm just going to tell you, you and I are hanging out on, uh, grabbing a drink and you and I just met and we're just hanging out. Okay. This is what I would tell you about what I would do with my kids. Um, I feel hyper strong about benzodiazepines as a no-no. Okay. I have it written into my psychiatric power of attorney that if I get institutionalized, they still can't give me those drugs. I'd rather be institutionalized than be on those drugs and out into the world. Okay. So I have a very strong, um, and that's off of Anna Limke's work and any number of psychiatrists who are now beginning to write more and more about this ongoing benzo crisis that we got. I will also say that there are some SSRIs that are magic for dealing with anxiety. There are... Do you mind just elaborating what the, the benzo myopene and SSRI are? <laughs> It's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, right? So an SS, it's, there are two different medications that have two different brain chemistry pathways. Um, one basically keeps the, it's just the way the, the synapses, the, the neurons talk to each other across synapse and SSRIs are going to be traditional stuff like Prozac, right? And it simply okay. keeps more stuff hanging around. Benzos are the Xanaxes of the world and it, it's, a, it's a rabbit hole, okay? And so... I have, I would have no problem if I sat down with somebody and they said, all right, we've done all the stuff. Your son, um, at this point, he's so dysregulated. His alarm system is so sensitive right now. Like, dude, you've been in a, you've been in a hotel where you have, you steaming up the shower, you know, and it sets off the fire alarm, the smoke alarm. That's just an out of tune. It's a, it's a, it's a dysfunctional alarm system. Your 11 year old may be there and that's okay. Um, what an SSRI is going to do is going to help turn that alarm down a little bit. It will not solve the problem, but what it will allow him to do is to then go sit with a counselor, to then begin to regulate some of these um, behaviors that you and I were just talking about a minute ago. And be very open with the doctors about mom's um, opioid addiction, about the prenatal use of opioids, and um, your concerns about addictive behaviors and any good psychiatrist will walk alongside you in that journey. Tell them that you want to try any and all behavioral interventions before you get medication, okay? But I do think a psycho uh, eval is, is important right now, okay? That doesn't mean they're going to take your kid from you and dope them up for eternity. You're still the parent, okay? Now- That's my concern. If you sit with the doctor and they say, look, you talk to some nut job on a podcast who said, stay away from benzos. We think this is the best thing for you right now. You can say, great, I'm going to go get a second opinion and go get a second opinion and tell that psychiatrist exactly what happened. I went in saying, I, I, if, if we have to do meds, let's do SSRIs. Um, they forced benzos. Do you agree with that? And dude, they're the doctors and I'm not. And so at some point you have to decide, I'm going to go off into the woods and treat this on my own, or I'm going to listen to the doctors. And I also know that you've got a, um, you got burned bad by them in the past. You lost the love of your life. And all she did was whatever the doctors told her, right? That's right. That's right. And so this is a scary season right now. So all I'm telling you is how I would approach this if these were my kids. I cannot give you medical advice and I can't give you even therapeutic advice because I don't have that sort of relationship with you or your kid. But sure. I'm just telling you what I would do um, if it was my kid, ultimately, I think your kid needs some professional intervention. And I also absolutely understand your, um, discomfort with that. It's well earned. I'm just, I'm just also worried that my daughter might ultimately hit down the same path. I, I think, I think it, I think there's a, every reason to believe that here's the deal. Some kids respond by punching kids. Other kids respond with straight A's. Um, often young, young girls will exhibit ADHD and anxiety by getting really quiet and following all the rules. And so we don't know what's going on inside of them because we're just looking for the demonstrative behaviors. They're going to either violate to violate whatever rules we have, or they're going to cause further chaos. And so, yes, I would expect growing up in the home of an addict with a mother who used, um, while she was in utero and all of the relational chaos and the divorce, I would expect there to be challenges with your daughter as well. That's why getting upstream with 
dad connection, with skin to skin contact, with, hey, I'm teaching you what choice looks like. I'm teaching you what the gap between stimulus and response looks like. All of those things are going to create a new household. And so going all the way back to the very first thing I told you, we're not looking for, well, it's because mom left, because here's the natural tendency is that I'm going to find somebody to replace mom. And that's not how that works. Um, what we need to do is we need to change the entire air in that home. And let me tell you one last thing. You, my friend, have got to do some healing work on your own. Is that fair? Yes. Yeah. Your son, and I, and I don't say this in a shaming way, I say this in an empowering way, is absorbing your tension and chaos too. Okay? And so the, one of the greatest gifts you could give him is for you to go see somebody and begin getting well yourself. Is that fair? That is fair. Okay. Um, you will also set a, give him a picture of what a, a grown man who's going to get help looks like. And that would be one of the greatest gifts you can give him long, long term. Okay. Yes. So please go see a psychiatrist or go see a professional. Okay. It's expensive to get an eval. Very, very expensive. Um, and if you get a good one, it can be worth its weight in gold. And it will give a roadmap okay. to you. And do not hesitate to speak up. And also, um, don't hesitate to get a second opinion if you're uncomfortable, okay? Okay. Is that fair? Something's got to change. There, um, there you go. But so, I'm just, you know, I don't, I don't want to lose my kids. That's right. They're great little people. Um, in the same, if you will in, introduce the, the choice language that I was talking about in your home, um, instead of yelling, and by the way, from this call on, we don't yell anymore. Cool? I've been working on that. I know, I know. But let's don't work on it anymore. Let's just say no more. And here's what we're going to do. You're going to introduce choice to your kids very, very soon. Like this weekend, probably. And when you are about to blow, I want you to look at your son or your daughter and say, I'm choosing to step away for a minute so that I can be in control of my body. And then I want you to step away for a minute and go walk around the house. And then okay. you come back and you are teaching your son, you're giving him a picture of what regulating your body looks like, regulating your emotions looks like, what then when that hurt and fire come up, how to release it. Because those punches he's throwing, that's just his version of you yelling. It's, it's that, that overrun of emotion, right? And so I want you to lead the charge in your home on showing what this looks like. And that also means you got to get some counseling ASAP, brother. Will you do that? Yes. I, I did a little bit, but I, I clearly have work to do. I want you to go into a counselor and say, I want to heal and be well. I don't just want to talk endlessly for the next nine months. I want to learn to heal and be well. Okay. And let's start there. Okay. There's going to be a lot of action. Not a lot. There's going to be some talking for sure. There's going to be a lot of action, a lot of changing your behaviors. Okay. I want you to stay on the line. I'm going to send you a copy of my new book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future. Here's the deal. At some point, you're going to sit down and you're going to own what happened. Your whole world blew up. Your wife got sick and your whole world blew up. And then you have to be about what are we going to do next? Okay. okay. Uh, so hang on the line here. We're going to send it to you. Do you commit to going to see somebody yourself and taking your kid to see somebody? I want to hear you say it. I'm going to heal myself to make my kids better. Nope. You're going to heal no, yourself because you're, you. you're worth being loved, my man. Okay. Hey, you didn't fail you're your right. wife, dude. Stop carrying that around. You did not fail her. I hear you. The medical system did. She struggled a whole, She and she probably has a whole lineage. You got to set that down, man. This isn't on you. You didn't fail. Did you drop pills in her drinks? Clearly not. Okay. <laughs> well, so, some of the calls I get on the show aren't so clear. You didn't fail. So you're not going to get well for your kids. You're going to get well for you. Because you deserve that. to be well. And by doing that, they're going to have a chance to be well too. They're lucky to have you, my man. And starting today, everything is different. Everything's different. Um, hang on the line here. We're going to get you the stuff. And if you would like, um, we can clip this call for you raw and send it to you so that you don't have to wait a month before this thing launches and have some of that um, info. So we'll see if we can get that to you in the next couple of days. Hang on the line here. And uh, everybody else, we'll be right back. Have you ever thought about how a lot of us would drop anything to help somebody else, but we often don't give ourselves the same level of care 
We spend time, energy, money on everyone else. But when it comes to making time for vacation, for exercise, for talking with a mentor, for sleep, even going to therapy, we don't do it. And we don't even realize it, we don't even think about it. You are worth it. This month, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you that you are important, that you are worth being well, and therapy is a super important way you can show up for yourself. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, even live chat sessions with your therapist. You don't even have to see anyone on a camera if you don't want to. It's more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Today, Dr. John Deloney Show listeners get 10% off their first month. So decide to invest in yourself. You are worth it. And go to betterhelp.com slash Deloney to get 10% off. That's betterhelp.com slash Deloney. All right, we are back. Let's go to Lacey in Iowa. What's up, Lacey? Hey, how's it going? We're partying. How about you? <laughs> um, uh, trying to do the same, a little bit at a time. <laughs> Very cool. What's up? So, in the great words of Whitney Houston, I want to feel the heat with somebody, <laughs> in particular, <laughs> that somebody, my husband. <gasps> Um, I want to dance with somebody. Hey, listen, this is amazing, but uh, I went to this incredible uh, uh, heavy metal concert the other night, this this hardcore show, and that was the intro song. Like, all the lights go down, and that's the song they played. And I smiled from ear to ear and thought, this show's going to be incredible. And the fact that you just brought that up is just perfect. So good for you. All right, let's get back into it. Okay, so you want to party. Husband's not so down. Tell me more. I would say my husband wants to try to be down to the party, but um, we've been together for about nine, 10 years, five of those married. And um, we have tried every avenue imaginable to not only like increase the romance dating life, but also the intimacy realm. Um, and I have particular preferences that are probably not safe to say on a public <laughs> podcast, but you can't, um, they you can't. are very, Hold on. very particular. Hold on. You <laughs> remember back in middle school when somebody would like be like, Hey, Lacey, um, I know someone who likes you and uh, I'm never going to tell you. And they just leave. You can't do that. You can't call and be like, I've got this crazy <laughs> thing. And then everybody, every, listen, number one, nobody's listening to this show. We all know that, right? Um, and number two, you can't just drop that. So what? what is your thing? Oh, uh, my sexual um, tendencies are more risque into the uh, abbreviations of BDSM. Okay. And I... I have always had that interest and I learned to dial back to meet my husband's needs because he has never had any other sexual partners aside from me. Okay. And he only had one other long-term relationship before me and that was just in high school. So, um, he has spent the last, you know, nine, 10 years learning with me how to do the things that I need and would like. Okay. And in turn, you know, I do the things that he enjoys and likes. Okay. However, in, in very plain terms, I mean, he's always vanilla. He likes his same old, same old, and he's just a sappy, heartfelt guy that's, he's just a big cuddler. And <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm really the opposite of that. I'm like, every touch of the skin could, you know, it just sets my soul on fire, and I'm like, what's coming next? I'm just alive and ready for more. Okay. And with him, it doesn't really go any more than that. So I guess we're just rolling around in like the same routines and we have been for a long time and it got pretty bad about a year and a half ago. We had, you know, just kind of came to the conclusion that beyond therapy and medications and all kinds of session treatments that we just weren't compatible in that realm. And it really hurt my heart because I love the daylights out of this guy and he loves me endlessly. And we didn't want to call it quits just because, you know, we weren't romantically connected in the same ways. And we just felt like we were living like, like roommates almost, you know, like come home, do the chores, do your day to day job and, you know, chat about your day. And that was it. So we're just trying to find a new way to make 
us compatible in that way. And I, I don't know if that sounds weird to say out loud, but no, not at um, all. I, I'm just, I'm stuck. I don't, I don't know what else to do that would get him to want to participate in the ways that I need both in the dating world and in the intimacy realm. Um, so I'm not living that same old regurgitated vanilla lifestyle that I'm just not so in love with. <laughs> you, <laughs> you're so, uh, uh, the way you're, you're so descriptive and it's beautiful. The regurgitated vanilla. That's the kind of sex that everybody likes is regurgitated <laughs> vanilla. God almighty, Lacey. Uh, um, okay, so, man, there's so much here. I, I, You and I could talk for a couple hours um, and you're a joy to talk to. So, number one. Oh, thank you. Um, being into what you're into with your husband, I, I, I really don't want you to, f you're coming at this with a specter of shame or a specter of weird. And maybe it's just, you're just trying to be respectful of this show and stuff like that. So, um, there's nothing that I say that every time I say nothing, I'm always surprised. Um, very few things surprise me when a couple gets together and like, like, Hey, we've been, we've been married for five years or nine years. And I, this is kind of what does it for me. Everybody's different. The challenge, like you mentioned is, how do I say this out loud? How do I let my needs be spoken into being? And how do I let somebody hear them? And then how do we figure out what comes next, right? That's the hard part. And so I like to think of intimacy as just about closing the gap, reaching across whatever you know gap of discomfort there is and saying, this is me, this is all of me. Are you still in, right? Right. What I hear you conflating is romance, intimacy, and sexual preference. Mm -hmm. And I think when you conflate the three of those three things like that, they all, they all are linked. But when you conflate all three of them, you find yourself in a position where you can never be happy. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Every single thing is sexually charged with you. Is that right? You said every yes. time, like, like he can walk by you in the kitchen and just put his hand on your hip as he's trying to get around you. And you're like, it's on now. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> Okay. Um, and he can also not do that. And you begin to wonder what's wrong. Is that fair or no? Yes. Okay. Where does that stem from? Um, I have a medical condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome. Okay. And part of that comes from, um, in, uh, a bad balance of hormones. I shouldn't say bad, but it's just very abnormal. Um, and so I have the testosterone of two men. Yeah, don't ever, ever, ever say they're bad. Things, never say they're bad. Is that cool? Right. This right. is this is yes. just your. This is just how you roll. Yeah. Yes. It, it's it's just, different. It. It's different than most women I know. So they, they're <laughs> yeah. like, "Geez, this is you. You want what?" Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm and, like, and I'm thinking, yeah, it is. It's a thing. All the the of the spectrum of people listening, you know, I can imagine there's a, a cluster of men going, what, what, this exists, right? So I get that. And, <laughs> right, and then, it, right. but there's also a reality to it too, right? Yeah. Which is hard. Um, okay. Well, so I mean, my husband and I have had very cordial conversations about it and very like deep conversations so much so that I explain I've showed pictures and videos we've you know we've gone through the whole gamut of you know different means of therapy and talking things out so I'm not ashamed to talk about it I'm not embarrassed or anything like that even to friends and family who are honest and really want to know so I mean he knows exactly exactly what I'm looking for but okay. it's just hard for him to to have that desire to do those things because it's just not in his nature. He's just a lover. He's not like a, well, e a hard and heavy person. Like even I'm, like even I'm looking for hard and heavy people don't always like being hit. Or the one that I've heard over time is they don't feel comfortable hitting somebody out. You know what I mean? So it's it's both yes. in it, right? And yes. um. <sighs> So here's the hard question. How old are you? I'm going to be 30 in a year, okay. in less than a year. Here's the hard, hard question. Are you going to leave him? Mm, I don't want to No, 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 because I know the last couple of years you've had this thought you wouldn't be calling me. Are you going to leave him? No. Okay. 
Here's why that answer, the answer to that is very, very important because then it reframes how much work we're going to do, how we're going to re-imagine re, um, this conversation. Because right now, this is about a particular sex act that you want that he won't do. Or let's be honest, like with, if you're fully down the BDSM rabbit hole, it's a context and it's an environment that you like, right? Yes. And it mm -hmm. is a particular um, power hierarchy, right? Whether it's a sub or a dom, there's a whole lineage here, right? Mm, right, And yep. it's a whole context. And so uh, if you are all in on this person and together y'all do not create this context, what you have to be willing to do is to say, okay, how do I get a super charged libido? How do I get my, I'll crave contact and I crave, um, uh, what I would call an increased heart rate. Is that fair? Yep. Like I, if it's not, and by the way, you know, that how this thing rolls, right? It, it just increases. Cause I got to keep pushing that yeah. boundary. Right. So yep. how do I create an environment where we do that on terms that don't also isolate my husband? And mm. so we're not trying to figure out ways that he can dress up and things that make him feel uncomfortable. We're not trying to figure out ways that he can, um, hit me or be hit in ways that make him freak out. That's not what we're trying to do. Sure. We're not trying to accomplish this particular sec. What we're trying to do is find new environments. The masterpiece is the book Come As You Are by Emily Nagotsky. Have you read that book? No, but I've heard you mention it many times, so, so I'm, if, I'm eager to read it. Here's why that book is so important. I think both of y'all need to read it together. Here's why that book is important. You think of this in terms of sex drive and that you have a high one, he has a low one. Is that fair? Yes. What she did for me was reframe the entire thing and sex isn't about drive at all. It's environmental. It's, all, it's ecological in a way. It's, it is how do I create a world where there's as few offs as possible and a few ons as possible. And what that does with somebody with a particular sexual fetish is it begins to let them stop focusing on that object or that thing or that this one singular environment and begin to look at a bigger picture. Okay. I'm trying to think of, um, this is somebody who gets amped up and the only th way they just, in high school, um, they were a weightlifter on the football team. And so they're 48 now and all they can do is lift weights and all of a sudden both shoulders blow out and they go to rehab and stuff, but they can't lift heavy like they used to. And that, that their body still needs that release. And so they learn how to get that release cycling or wrestling or rowing or any number of other things. That's what we're doing here. Not because sure. inherently the thing's wrong, but inherently that particular environment makes your husband feel less than or um, uh, scared or frightened or whatever, and you love him too much to do that. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. yeah. So are you willing to consider alternative environments? Yes. That and still include- I have asked for those okay. as well. And I think those, that definitely makes him uncomfortable because in his like, you know, vanilla nature, where he's comfortable is- exactly where he's comfortable not that <laughs> loose performance function outside of that area but you know it, it takes a lot longer to build up the energy and the 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 rush to get going in a place outside of norm so yes and so he's gonna have to also reimagine this thing too and be willing to lean in and say okay this particular actions in this particular environment, I, I can't get there. I've tried. I can't get there. Mm -hmm. Can we figure out other ways that at this moment are like, what? Can we just cuddle, have boring married person sex? Can we just do that? Right? <laughs> it, it may be that um, there is some sort of uh, we're going to create a um, deck of cards and we're going to put a particular act on it and we're just going to draw out of a deck and my heart rate will get up hoping that it's this one and his heart rate will get up hoping it's um, that we're just going to lay here and watch the office, whatever the thing is. But we're going to do these things together that are going to create a context that our heart rates are going to get up and that you are going to get the skin to skin and the, um, the, if I, I'm trying to say words that instantly roll into like, sound like sex acts words, but I mean, that's not what I mean. But I mean the visceral response, right? That your body craves, okay? Right. Um, 
This is less about, hey, we need to go find some new videos. And this is more about, I want you guys to reimagine the whole spectrum here. So do me this favor. Number one, know that you're not broken and he isn't either. Number two, this isn't about trying to dial up his sex drive or dial yours back. Number three, BDSM is a proxy for an environment that gets you skin-to-skin contact, that makes you able to put your head in a different psychological place, that gets a, um, that is rough and that gets your body moving in a different way, right? So mm-hmm. where can we create, can we set that proxy aside for a second and begin to create a new environment where we still get those things, but everybody's okay? And I know you're thinking, dude, I've had this conversation with him a million times. I want you all to read this book together and begin to say, okay, um, maybe it's, we go once a, a month, we go get a hotel room somewhere and it looks like this, or maybe, like I said, we have five things in an envelope and we draw one out once a week and we, no matter what's going on, we do that thing. Or maybe it's different parts of the house or in the car, in the garage, like any number of places and things you can do, or you can go. Let's begin thinking outside the box. And what you're going to do is not close your box. You're going to begin to look at uh, other options and he's going to begin to expand his. And y'all are going to look at this as a series of brakes and gas pedals. How can I turn more of the ons on and more of the offs off? A couple of exercises that uh, Dr. Nagoski has in the book is let's get beneath the fetish and say, what are the things here that are turning you on? Let's do a step. Let's be real clear. Let's write them down. What are the things he gets by cuddling and closeness and, as you say, regurgitated vanilla? How do, how do y'all get to those places? Write those things down, and let's start to look for overlap here and say, okay, oh, we can both meet in the middle here, meet in the middle here. What if we tried this, and what if we tried this? And then we're going to have postmortem, which is not super fun, but we're learning new things. And here's the big word. We're practicing new ways of being intimate with one another. And remember, intimacy is not about how we have sex. Intimacy is I'm bridging the gap of discomfort. I'm willing to bridge that gap. Do you see me? And do you still love what you see? And that's hard. And we often, I find in my own relationship, all relationships, that's a recurring question, a recurring thing. Do you see me? And do you still love me? Lacey, you're awesome. Uh, I've got the highest hopes for your marriage. Please let me know. I want you to read through this book. Let me know how um, the homework assignments go on the back end. Reach back out to me. And if you want to call back on the show and we can keep this conversation going, I would love that. We'll talk to you soon. And everybody will be right back. Y'all know there are lots of things that make me nuts. But one thing makes me more nuts than anything else. Buying a home. And my friends who refinance their homes, they tell me it makes them nuts too. I love living in a new home. But I got to be honest. I'm no good at buying one. And that's why I'm so thankful for people like my friends at Churchill Mortgage. Churchill is a Ramsey trusted provider who we've been sending people to for over 20 years to help with home mortgages. Why? Because they're committed to doing what's right for you. And that means walking you through paperwork that's way over your head. That means making sure you get the right mortgage that you can pay off as soon as possible. And they don't try to upsell you a bunch of nonsense that's gonna hurt you down the road. And most importantly, when you're making this big life change, you can actually breathe because you got an expert and a team who have your back. Listen, if you're about to buy a home and make a big change, save yourself the headache and call Churchill Mortgage today at 888-LOAN-200. Trust me, that's 888-LOAN-200. This is a paid advertisement, NMLS ID 1591, NMLSConsumerAccess.org, Equal Housing Lender, 1749 Mallory Lane, Suite 100, Brentwood, Tennessee, 37027. Programs are for select loan types only and are not available in all states or locations. All right, we are back. Let's go to Terry in Fort Worth. Hey, Terry, what's up? Um, hi, Dr. John. How are you? How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Uh, How are you? I'm, I'm okay. Uh, I'm okay. Got some stuff going on? <laughs> Lots of stuff going on. Oh, I'm uh, so yes. sorry. Okay, um, let's do it. What's up? Okay, I'm calling about uh, my 20 year old daughter. Okay. Um, uh, she's on the autism spectrum. Uh, diagnosed shortly before her sixth birthday. Um, had lots of therapy in her early childhood, and uh, everything went great. Um, I mean, 
to the point where her primary and secondary education, she was able to get through without any type of medication. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the last three years, I've seen a decline, Mm -hmm. um, significant decline. And um, the insurance at my job, it's almost $300 a pay period just for health insurance. And then she doesn't Um, she's not eligible for any type of chip or Medicaid because I'm slightly over that bracket as well. And I'm just at, I'm lost because I'm not sure how to help her. Um, there's also, she dealt with bullying in school to an extreme extent. Um, um, and there was also some abuse. In sexual, younger childhood. Sexual abuse, sexual. physical abuse? Yes. Yes, okay. sexual. Okay. And it, it's it's just a lot. I'm trying to um, help her come to grasp with um, try therapy uh, once in 2019, once in 2020. Um, and the issues were never brought to light, to discuss. And so I, I'm, I'm at a loss. Okay. I, I'm at a loss on how to help my daughter. So the first thing, just as a fellow parent, I'm sorry, this hurts. And you're watching your daughter, somebody that you love and you invested your whole life in to really struggling. And that hurts for everybody. Just as a fellow parent, I'm sitting here with you and I'm sorry. That hurts, man. Um, so Let me ask a couple of just detail questions and then we can kind of get right into it. Um, what kind of accommodations does she re- did receive in middle school and high school especially? Um, she had um, what was called, oh gosh, what was the term? Uh, gosh, it seemed like so long ago, where there was um, assistance if she needed it. Mm-hmm. Um, it. It wasn't like someone, you know, following her throughout the day, but if she needed assistance yeah. um she, she uh, could get that, like note taking assistance or oh yes okay yes, um if she needed yes. uh, now extra early time in, on a test or something yes exactly okay. and that was needed in elementary not so much in um middle school and high school but in elementary yes she had okay. those uh, resources is she to going to co- is she going to college now she actually just completed her first year of college very cool and so yes. was that a struggle Oh, yes. Okay. All right. Oh, yes. Uh, The first semester um, was virtual. Okay. um, Which was last year. I mean, last semester, this semester that she just finished, she was on campus. Um, She would share a ride. Share a ride would pick her up, you know, bring her to the campus. Mm -hmm. And is she still living at home with you? She is. Okay. She is. And she (sighs) wants to have some more independence. And I know that's needed at a certain point. I just know I need to get her those resources to help her okay. to navigate yes. everything that she is experiencing and has experienced. So here's, um, all right, so there's a couple of things here. Um, there is some, let me put it this way. I've seen students go to college. Um I'm, I'm assuming she's relatively high functioning, right? Yes. Um, yes. That, she hates that term, but yes, she is. I, I know. I hate that term too. Um, I despise that term because there are seasons when I'm low functioning and high functioning, and I think it's a complete, uh, it's a it's a nonsensical phrasing, but it's just what we got right now. Um, the uh, so I've seen students go to college and absolutely blossom. In tremendous ways. Um, Even students who would be um, generally classified as um, like median functioning, like really have a lot of challenges. Um, And so the first thing I would do is look at my university system that my child's a part of and sit down with the um, ADA 504 coordinator, the disability services, and sit down with the counseling center. And okay. to say, here are all of the resources available to me. And I've been, and I can't even tell you how many of those meetings I've been in. Um, they are generally extraordinary. 
Okay. And often the other thing happens, and so I painted you a rosy picture. Often kids will go to school who've had all kinds of accommodations and they are on the spectrum. They want to just go finally jump in and be quote unquote normal like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I always tell students, always, 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 do not stop doing your things your first year. Continue with the accommodations. If you're taking meds, you just, I just want to stop doing all, continue doing that because the transition is so significant. The pace is so much faster. There's so many more inputs coming. And for a kid's, uh, an autistic child, all of that sensory input is just can be overwhelming. And everybody everywhere all the time, it's just a lot, right? So I would really lean into those institutional resources. And okay. by the way, you're already paying for all of them. You're yeah. paying for all of them. And so it, you may have to pay for an, um, an ABA diagnostic, right? That will, that if you don't already have one of those, you probably already have one of those. Here's the bigger picture that I'm hearing. And this may or may not, I mean, you and I have just met each other like a second ago on the phone. At some point, your daughter's going to have to deal with the sexual abuse and the bullying. Yeah. And I would plug her into a therapist on campus with the, this, this level of detail. I was sexually abused as a kid. I was autistic. And so I was mercilessly bullied as a child and into middle school and high school. And I need help healing. So take that type of direct language. What is not helpful for any of us, much less somebody on the spectrum, is just going to a therapist and talking mindlessly about feelings for day on day on day on day on day. Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. It's not helpful. Yeah. I need some new actions to help my body X, Y, and Z. Okay? Absolutely. Um, so be that bold. And really, she needs to be that bold because she's 20. And that leads me to my last thing here. Mama, at some point, you're going to have to let this, this little girl go. Okay. And that's super hard. And I don't mean go and stop being, um, you know, not, uh, not being attuned to her life, not making sure she's going to her appointments, asking about meds, not that stuff. But in your mind, she's still that elementary school or middle school girl that you're trying to take care of because you love her and you know, she's different and you know, people have been mean to her and hurt her and you'll be damned if it's going to happen again on your watch. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's the, that, that impulse is beautiful. And that impulse is what's going to keep her from going to this next level, which is navigating a messy, ugly, hard world with um, neurological differences, not being neurotypical, right? Okay. Is, is, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. Is that, is that true? No, you're right. You're right. Okay. Absolutely. So, if if she was on the phone with me now, how would she describe you? Um, loving, uh, protective. <laughs> you said, you said it perfectly. I'm actually working from home. A beautiful, exactly stunning. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> uh, so she would she would label you as protective, both in the best and the worst of ways, right? Yes. Yes. How would she prefer to get to school? Can she drive? No, no, she share rides. Um, but, but can she drive? No, she cannot. Could not she yet. drive? Could she learn to? Um, I guess I'm not the one to teach her because I shouldn't teach anyone how to drive. <laughs> but she should. She, Terry, you're skirting my question because you're this brilliant. Summer she would learn. We did say this summer we would try some uh, driving lessons, okay. driving courses. Yeah. So it's time to let this young woman grow up. She make does she do well academically? Yes. Uh, besides the struggles this last uh, semester, one A, a B, and two Cs. So, okay. Yes. Um, for a given what she's got going through, both environmentally and neurologically, and if she went through that whole semester without any accommodations after receiving them, then that's she did a great job, right? Yeah. And yeah, she did. That's that's super impressive. You wait till see she gets the help that she needs and she's going to shoot through the roof like on a rocket ship, okay? okay? And so here's what here's all all of this is is coming down to this is a intentional graduated plan to begin to teach her the adult skills and this is sooner rather than later teach her the adult skills she needs to go be successful. 
And you know what a big part of this is going to be? You, Terry, are carrying around the guilt of the sexual abuse. And you, Terry, are carrying around the guilt of the bullying. And you're carrying around the guilt of her having autism. And I need you to forgive yourself to set those bricks down. And I want you to go talk to somebody about how to let this little girl go. Will will you do that? Because you deserve that, Terry. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. That shame is holding you down and keeping you from breathing all these years later. You got to set that stuff down. Will you do that? Absolutely. Okay. You hang on the line too. I'm going to send you a copy of the new book also on your past change of future. And uh, I want you to read through that book. And all that whole book is about setting bricks down. Okay. Thank you so much. And I want you to call a counselor. And man, if I'm you today, I'm getting on the phone with the ADA office. Uh, actually, I'm going to sit with my daughter because she's tw- she is 20. And we're going to talk to her about what we're doing. Um, it's not great for any college kid just to show up and find out parents have been calling unless they're worried about some significant exactly. psychiatric issues. Hey, we're going to call the a, uh, ADA office and we're going to call the uh, the disabilities office and we're going to call the counseling services and we're going to take advantage of all these services that we're paying for at this university. And we're going to lean heavily into a behavior plan and we're going to make a list. Ask, your, ask that baby girl of yours who's now 20. Ask her, well, okay, I've been on you for a long time. What are some things you'd like to be doing on your own? Like driving, like maybe getting her own apartment someday, like some of these other things. And let's come up with a plan to get there. And then after all that's done, your heart's gonna be beating. You may even get teared up. I want you to exhale. And then I want you to get online. And I want you to call a counselor and say, it's time for me to start getting well too. You, my sister, deserve that. We'll be right back. Hey, what's up? Now that my new book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future, is out in the wild, we've been hearing reviews and feedback from readers, and wow, I'm so grateful. And one of the things I've been most excited about hearing is that this book is not just for people who are healing from terrible traumatic experience or other big scary things from their past. This book is for everyone in every walk of life. The single 30-year-old looking to sharpen their mind, the 25-year-old hoping to make new friends, the parent who's tired of seeing their kid's eyes glued to a screen, but who doesn't know how to re-enter their life, people coming out of abusive relationships, everyone. And this book isn't me talking at you. This book is me walking with you because I've been there too. To better understand and improve your mental, relational, and emotional health, please check out Own Your Past, Change Your Future at johndeloney.com today. That's johndeloney.com today. All right, what a show. That was a long one, and that was a heavy one. And man, that was, took me back to grad school in a few of those. And um, a lot of people struggling, a lot of people hurting, and a lot of people just trying to love better. And that's such a good reminder for all of us. Don't stop trying to love better. Don't stop trying to heal. Don't stop trying to love the people around you, whether it's your kids, whether it's your partner. Who, so grateful. So, so grateful. As you wrap up today's show, of course you knew we were going to do it. It's the, it's the classic, Whitney Houston, I want to dance with somebody. And it goes like this. Clock strikes upon the hour, and the sun begins to fade. Still enough time to figure out how to chase my blues away. I've done all right up till now. It's the light of day that shows me how. And when the night falls, loneliness calls. We've all been there. So I want to dance with somebody. I want to feel the heat with somebody. Yeah, I want to dance with somebody, somebody who loves me. I've been in love and lost my senses spinning through the town. Sooner or later, the fever never ends, and I wind up feeling down. (sighs) I want to dance with somebody. Don't we all? And that's what this show's about, dancing with each other. We'll see you soon. Coming up on the next episode. Summer's coming up, and I've been thinking a lot about the fact that we've always been a little sloppy and letting them sleep in really late, want them wood till noon if we let her, you know, lay around and watch TV. And I'm just kind of, I'm wanting to balance. I love the idea of getting kids up at six and seven and getting their butts out to work, especially in the summer. To all you people out there like, well, kids just got to suck it up and get out. You're right. I know. I wish that was the case. But look around. Our teenagers are literally falling apart underneath us. How do we honor our 13-year-old daughter's wishes to not take action against her molester? 
and also do what we feel is right. I'm gonna give it to you straight as an arrow, okay? Over 200 times someone molests a child before they're finally caught. Your 13-year-old does not get to drive this. You have to report it, full stop. 